So very pleased to, to welcome Kate Pembley, who I saw at, um, it was the RCOT housing um, conference probably a couple of months ago in in deepest, darkest Coventry. Um, it was indeed. The weather was lovely. Though. It, so it was, it was. Clearly it was. that's where the summer went. I think so. I think so. It was a couple, couple of days of sunshine in Coventry where um, Kate did a, a kind of presentation that went down very well with the um, with the house goatees. So um, we asked her to come and, um, come and talk to you about it as well. So I'll put your slides up, Kate, and, and hand over to you. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, so, yeah, my name is uh, Dr. <laughs> As I've been reminded today, Dr. Catherine Pemble, I work at the University of Stirling and today I'm presenting on a raft of work uh, done by the Designing Homes for Healthy Cognitive Aging or DESHKA project. Um, now, let me see if I can successfully flip slides first time. I can. When I say that it's a raft of research, this is not even all of the team. Uh, it's a huge effort across three years. We ran from 2021 up until 2024. And what our goal was, was essentially to look at the different ways that housing design and adaptation could support people to remain in the homes and communities of their choosing for longer. We were funded by the UKRI's Healthy Aging Challenge. So one of a big suite of tackling big questions and looking at how people can age better um, in the UK. Now, what does that look like in practice? Good ask. Uh, that's pretty much what we're going to talk about for the next half hour. Now, apologies for anyone who knows these statistics already, but just to go do a little bit of a run through. If the question is, why should we be focusing on housing for healthy cognitive ageing? Let's do some quick statistics. I promise not too many numbers in this presentation. The UK population aged over 65 in 2018 was estimated to be 18%. So that's just under one in five, which is pretty substantial. However, it's important to know that as we go towards 2050, we're looking at closer to one in four people being over the age of 65 and a significant proportion actually being over 85. I did at one point do the numbers and the math on where your birthday had to lie in order to push you over into the yellow, but I upset myself, so I will not be relaying those to you today. Important to know, though, that this is what we're, wor we're working towards. This is where we're going. And of these almost one in four, one in three will have a significant health care or significant, a, goodness me, a condition <laughs> requiring significant amount of health care by the time they're 70. So we have a population where almost one in four is over 65, where a significant portion of those have healthcare conditions that significantly impede them in one way or the other for the rest of their lives. Now, the other part of this that's important to take in, into fact is that an estimated 85% of adults would prefer to stay in the homes of their choosing as they age. However, only 10% of houses in the UK are adapted or equipped to support people as they get older, as they do begin to collect these different diagnoses, these different health conditions and these different frailties. 85%, 10%. Now, I'm a qualitative scientist. I work in words, but I can tell the difference between those two numbers. So if 85% of people would choose to remain at home, even if they get a diagnosis of dementia, and fewer than 10% of homes have the accessibility features to support anybody, let alone somebody living with dementia or any other kind of cognitive impairment, that's already a bit of an issue. We're going to talk today about some other statistics. We know that from our research, it looks like about 90% of adaptations are in the bathroom alone over that in fact, and that people who are living with dementia or their carers are three times more likely to say that they've received an adaptation that focuses on mobility rather than anything that supports their cognitive health. Now, that might be appropriate if you happen to have dementia and something that affects your mobility or your mobility is affected by your dementia, but it certainly doesn't deal with all of the cognitive aspects that you're potentially needing support with. And that's where Deshka comes in. From an academic perspective, there are a raft of issues that we knew going into this project. From the literature, we knew that while there were good pieces of research about accessibility, about adaptation, they usually had issues of scale. They usually focused down on one or two, maybe up to 10 uh, key houses that were used really as a pilot 
And then there wasn't a huge amount of discussion or consideration of what it would mean to take that up to scale, which is obviously an issue if we're heading into a future where one in four people is over the age of 65 living with a healthcare condition. There were issues around cost effectiveness and what that meant and cost effective critically for who and for what. A lot of the outcomes and measures of success that we used in other pieces of research were really defined by the researchers themselves, which can lead to a very slanted view of what something looks like when it's working or alternatively when it's not working. There were many barriers and facilitators to implementation, but those tended to be really local because of the scale. And while there were examples of promising practice, especially when adaptations and changes to the home were made early, there were a lot of local factors and inequalities that could factor into that. The postcode lottery seems to pervade throughout the research, which is not particularly surprising. Now, who holds the key to this question? It could be that older people themselves hold the key. This is fairly radical, the idea of asking people what they actually want as they get older. It could be that building professionals hold the key. They're the ones, after all, creating and adapting our housing stock or housing management, given that they are managing a good amount of the stock in the UK. It might be that health and social care holds the key. After all, we are talking about adapting for health conditions predominantly. Or it might be that policymakers are the ones who we really need to be targeting. It would be very simple and very lovely if the answers lay with just one of this group, but they don't. Spoilers, I suppose. Now, if things could move forward, how did we get this data? De Deshka did a huge amount of research over those three years, and this is just a bit of a, a taster of them. We did secondary data analysis, which means pulling in big data sets that already existed, gave us an insight into the lives of roughly speaking about 30,000 people or so. We did what we called a home audit, where we took the Dementia Services Development Centre's latest uh, dementia design guidance, crunched it down into essentially an online platform that people could use themselves and then encourage them to go through and mark uh, their own home on this basis. It gave us, as far as we can tell, one of the only pieces of research that identifies how dementia friendly homes in the UK really are, as opposed to how we would like them to be or how we would hope they to, them to be in the future. We did what's called an eDelphi panel, which is a consensus exercise where we get people together and try and really dig in and understand where the points of contention are when we start to talk about what inclusive design and age inclusive design really looks like and what people really want. We did a creative mapping exercise with 63 older families where we went directly to older people themselves and asked them to tell us about the house they lived in now, the houses they've lived in in the past and the houses they hope to live in in the future and what was important to them. We did passive sensing in 13 more households. This is where we attached uh, a range of fairly high tech sensors to the house to monitor things like air quality, heat and light. So we were essentially interviewing the house much in the same way that we interviewed the people. We did professional interviews with 21 people working in the building and construction industry to help understand things from that very business focused perspective. And we did nine, we ran 94 people through our VR workshops. And that is where we put uh, our designs really into the hands or perhaps the eyes of people themselves, both older people and professionals in various roles and asked them, what do you think? What do you like? What do you not like? What needs to change? And that design went through four iterations by the end. We had feedback workshops on those. And then we turned the entire thing into a serious game, which is funnily enough, a game you play for serious reasons leading to about 30,000 people, 30,813, if my math is correct, uh, involved in the project over the course of those three years. So that's a fair amount of data to be pulling from. Now, what did we learn from all of this and what do you need to know? One, adaptations are clustered. Our quantitative folks did a good amount of research and analysis on existing data sets, including the English uh, Longitudinal Study of Aging and the Scottish Household Survey. And they came out and, no, and said, you know, about 56% of households are reporting that they have some kind of adaptation. We had a look at that data and we chunked it down and decided that the reasonable way to look at these was to say that there were categories, three of them. One being property based, i.e. the adaptations that you install in the property and then become, for all intents and purposes, somewhat invisible. You don't think about using them anymore. Once you've installed a widened doorway, for example, you don't go through that doorway every time and go, oh, isn't this a lovely wide doorway? Or perhaps you do, but only if you're not bashing your fingers anymore. 
movement-based adaptations tended to be the ones that people were actively engaging with in order to get around. So that's your stair lifts, that's your handrails, anything that people were actively interacting with to get about their home. And then bathroom adaptations, which were funnily enough, adaptations in the bathroom. And those actually took up 93% of all adaptations that were being reported. 93% of adaptations put in the bathroom. And then obviously there's that statistic again, someone living with dementia three times more likely to get an adaptation that supports their physical function. And from what we've just discussed, probably their physical function specifically around bathing and toileting, something to do with the bathroom rather than any other part of their life. We had a look at the data spread that we got back from asking people to assess their own homes and we found statistics that actually really surprised us. We had kind of assumed gently that age would be a fairly good predictor of moving into an accessible home. It's a very bad predictor of moving into an accessible home. In fact, uh, on the left hand side, don't judge me, my rights and my lefts are difficult. Um, you can see that while people's um, health conditions do go up as they age, which tracks with everything else that we know, they do not, in fact, move into more accessible housing. That's your uh, hex plot on the right hand side. And for those of you not graphically inclined, I will add a little line here. That is a straight line pretty much across the data set in terms of age, people not moving into more adaptive homes and more supportive homes. So clearly we were wrong on that one, which opens a number of questions, certainly from our perspective. What we knew from that Edelphi, that consensus exercise, was that people had a fairly strong idea of what uh, age-inclusive home design should be. It should be modern. It should be beautiful, something that people were really proud to say that they lived in. It should have features that supported people living with physical, cognitive and sensory impairment, because as you get older, all of those things become more likely. It should be easy to heat and to cool. Remember, we were doing this research in the middle of both the back end of COVID and the cost of living crisis. So issues around affordability and particularly heat were really at the forefront of people's minds. It should be able to adapt to changing lifestyles. And that's not just in terms of people's needs, but people's lifetime. A house that you move into in your 30s should be able to accommodate you being there in your 30s and perhaps with a young family, but equally able to support you when that family move out or adapt to your changing needs as you moved into your 70s and 80s. That is what an ideal age inclusive home design would look like. It should be within walking distance of a vibrant intergenerational community. People didn't want to be siloed and stuck out on the outskirts. They wanted to be in a place that made them connected to their community and allowed them to keep doing crazy things like accessing food and getting a takeaway, both of which in the data. There was, however, less consensus around the kind of activities that should be supported if you live in an age inclusive home. Now, I'm not gonna ask anyone to read a lot of this very small text, but take it from me, we put together essentially a list of activities that other, thank you so much, that was very neat, um, that uh, other people suggested. We asked people, what kind of activities would you like to see be easier? And then for this graph, we went back to them and said, okay, give us your top 10. What are the top 10 most important things? And the results really surprised us. You're gonna hear this a lot, it's okay. For one thing, while things like staying independent and being physically active come really, really high, and that makes a lot of sense, the quick readers among you will notice that uh, going to the toilet is halfway down and having a bath and getting dressed are even lower than that. Those were activities that we thought people would be really intense about because it's all about your independence. They weren't. So we went back to them and said, we think that you've been categorizing these. We think if you've chosen staying independent in your head that means that you perhaps are also able to go to the toilet and get dressed and have a bath and do all of these things independently maybe that's about being physically active or maybe it's about doing activities you enjoy could you take these activities and drop them into categories for us which makes a lot of sense if we're going to be talking about how we adapt to your home to help you do these things what we discovered was people do not always talk about things in the same way. And I think this will resonate for a lot of particularly occupational therapists and people in the field. 
So when we asked people to go ahead and chunk down these activities so that when we said this house and this housing design will support you to do X, stay more independent, stay more active, we would all know what we're talking about. And while in some cases, it's very clear what the answer is. For example, listening to music, 90%, that is an enjoyed activity. Exercising, definitely a physical activity, 90% 90 happy with that. When you get down into some of the other things, when you start talking about doing the laundry, is it about physical activity or staying independent or having a bath or preparing food? How do we categorize that? When we're talking about how we support you, what adaptations should do to help you stay in the home, what is it that we're talking about? Are we talking about support you to do an activity that you like? Or are we talking about maintaining your independence or your physical activity? What is it? It brought up some real meaningful questions for us about how we listened to the people that we needed to talk to. I apologize in advance for this graph. It is tricky, but we'll walk through it and it's okay. Because here is the other thing that we found in that piece of research. Looking at the, uh, <laughs> the mess of color over over here, um, the adaptations that we tend to make predominantly focus on mobility. Those are your red uh, diamonds at the top of the uh, at the top of the layer. We do actually do a fair amount of changing our environment to suit our sensory needs. However, the thing I really need you to focus on are the purple circles. Now, the vast majority of those purple circles are actually coming in underneath that zero line meaning that when we make a change to a home, because these are the adaptation scores, they are making our homes often less accessible to us cognitively, even as they perhaps make them more accessible physically. And that's a key issue that we start to talk about, because if we're talking about healthy cognitive aging, we're not just talking about aging cognitively, we're talking about you in your body, with your mind, aging as one whole person through the rest of your life. And if your home is getting progressively less uh, accessible for you cognitively, that's obviously going to throw up issues, even if you don't end up with something like dementia. So how did we get more data? Apologies. How did we get more details on this? First off, we spoke to older people themselves. Uh, we conducted 61 interviews with people over the age of 55. Apologies to everyone who was just offended because I said older people were over the age of 55. You are not alone, <laughs> rest assured. And we walked them through what's called a creative mapping activity. So essentially, they sat down with us and for about an hour, they talked about the home and we mapped it out physically with them. Some people chose to do these uh, in online programs. Some people, most people chose to do it uh, with pen and paper. I got in a lot of trouble for not bringing up enough rulers. It was a good time. But the nice part about that is that that process of mapping it out and really drawing your environment helps bring back to the top of your head the things that you do and see every day that are not important. They're the tiny little trip that you make on the stair every morning. It's the coffee table that you bang your hip on, but you don't notice because it happens all the time and it's a split second and it's gone. This kind of creative mapping really brings that to the forefront. And it brought up a huge number of themes for us, which we'll not go through today because boring you is not on the docket. However, we will talk about a couple. One of the most important things that came up, for example, was the aesthetics of adaptation. Now, the lady here in uh, 28 is talking about making adaptations for her mother. She says that they had got wrought iron handrails on the conservatory steps, on the utility steps and on the garage, because she might as well get it on all three, which seems fair. It looks nice. They are wrought iron, big and ornate, ornate rather than what she calls handicap steps. Now I ask her, are you not feeling the white PVC? And she says, my mom's 89 now, so this was when she was 79, and she didn't think she was old, and she didn't want to look like she was old, and she didn't want it to look like a council house. No offence to anyone from the council house, but she didn't want it to look like I'm an old person and this is all that's available. She wanted it to look nice because there's pride in what you have. Whoever you are, there's pride in what you have. And this came up again and again and again in the data. Issues around, for example, where handles were placed. So P34 talking here about the handles are not placed in a place that's good even for an able-bodied person. She doesn't like where they are. And she asked specifically at the time, can you not give me wood? Does it have to be white PVC? Can you not give me wood? And was told no. But if you go away and you get them yourself, we will come back and fit them for you. And then life happened. They've been in that home for years and they've never gone through the process of getting those handles refitted. 
why does it matter? Our, our, our 128th participant did really well in highlighting for us. Why do aesthetics matter? Because this is not just a home for living in. This, for some people, is the home that they prefer to die in. So she's saying here, my favorite room is the lounge, definitely, because I have views, I have big windows. I have windows, big windows from floor to ceiling, and it's a beautiful room. I love it to bits. I want to die sitting on my favorite chair in the bay window looking out to see. That's my ambition. This is my dying position. That's how I want to die, sitting in there. And I want everybody to have a party in that room afterwards. This is a home that has a life element that we love, that the social part is important. We have to have room for people to be here. And what does that mean for how we adapt it as we age? These issues around living at home came up over and over again. So 15 here talking about how important it is for her that she can get the family together for a meal, even though they only live 400 yards away. She still needs space within her home that works for hosting. And that came up a lot. We made the mistake of asking uh, person 83 um, if a particular room was her hobby room. And she says, yes, but it's not a hobby. I'm a serious artist and it's my job. It's my career. It's my identity. So we need a space that works for that. And then in the last part, it's a collaborative effort. Often a lot of people are aging, not just in a house all on their own or in an apartment all on their own, but they're aging with others. So how we negotiate our shared tasks, how we maintain our shared home is a big, big issue. We also interviewed professionals and a fair few of them. And they talked to us about some of the issues that they saw on their side issues around staff knowledge, recruitment, retention, opportunities to hear back from users once they've moved into the designs that they created so that they could find out what really worked for people and what didn't. There was a lack of skills, tra skilled tradesmen to build age-inclusive designs, even if you could get the budget to do so. And that budget itself and the time scale were often an issue. There was a need to adapt to moving policies, issues around net zero and carbon neutrality and modern manufacturing methods and all of the other things that the construction industry are dealing with layered in with our issues around an aging population. So why can't we do it? What's holding us back? Big questions. First off is a stigmatized and limited understanding of what age inclusive design is and who can benefit from it. It's the people over there. I'm not old yet. Mum doesn't think she's old yet. She's 80, but she's not old yet. It's for that person over there who really needs it. There's a tendency to design and create homes for others that we would not wish for ourselves. The idea that white PVC should be good enough. Would I want it in my house? Absolutely not. It's heinous. And I've spent however long I've spent, 50 years, making my house just the way I like it. But if you need an adaptation, you should be happy enough with PVC. Right. And a lack of awareness of what age inclusive design is and how it can be included in a variety of homes. Even people we were working with and having contact with quite frequently thought that we were asking them to invest more in a very specific subset of home design. We're not. Our ask is much bigger than that because age inclusive design is age inclusive for everybody. So some takeaways for you to think about. What's the difference between home adaptation and home improvement? This was one of the biggest things we ran into when we were interviewing people about their own homes. We would go through the consent process, make sure people knew why we were there and they were happy to take part and they'd signed everything. And then for some of them, our first question was, OK, um, so just to kick off, break the ice, can you tell me about some of the adaptations you've made to your home? And more than once, the answer was, I've not made any bit of a dead dead silence after that one not a good opening gambit in an interview that's going to last an hour so we recalibrated stopped asking that question what we asked was what did this house look like when you moved in what's changed and when I tell you the range of adaptations we found absolutely phenomenal but they don't count as adaptations. You see, yes, I had my entire back lawn ripped out and replaced with AstroTurf because I can't mow it anymore but that's not an adaptation that's an improvement Yes, I went to the garden centre and got raised beds instead of getting down on my knees because I can't get down on my knees anymore. But that's not an adaptation. Yes, no, I had all of my, my carpets replaced with a wood floor, but that's not an adaptation. I did it on my own. 
adaptations were medical. They were the thing that the social work said that you had to have or the thing that came in because otherwise so-and-so wouldn't be released from hospital. There was a mental block between what people considered home adaptation and what they considered home improvement. And if people are given time and capacity and the ability to think about what they want and what it should look like for them, a lot of the adaptations we make can usually cross that line into home improvement. If you're refitting your kitchen, why wouldn't you make it more accessible? Why wouldn't you have the pull out drawers? You might as well, aren't they nice? It's a huge difference in mindset and looking at it. But what are we really talking about? What does it really look like? Key ideas, contrast. So while I'm sure the house on the left here is beautiful and lovely, it surely is. I can't imagine the dust, but that's not my problem. It does have an issue if you are ever going to have any kind of cognitive or physical impairment, which might change the way that you see the world. Now, if you are sensory dealing with visual loss, a little bit of a blur here, a, bit, a little bit of lowered saturation, and suddenly those pretty white doors sent a pretty white wall are completely invisible add on to that any kind of cognitive impairment at all, and suddenly you're stuck in a room that you don't necessarily know your way out of, and that's an incredibly distressing uh, place to be. We encourage people to think about cognition in design. Again, this beautiful white kitchen, I'm sure lovely, but I certainly couldn't tell you how to open any of these cupboards. Are they the ones with a little rim underneath? Are they the push to pull? Which ones of them are cupboards and which ones of them are the fake in place build stuff I, I really don't know and neither would someone living with any kind of cognitive impairment or indeed without a cognitive impairment but with a really nasty UTI so we suggest crazy things like handles so people know how to open cupboards uh, clear fronted cupboards so that you're no longer relying on your memory to work out where the glass is because you're thirsty things out on the countertop so that if I do decide that I'm thirsty or so-and-so's come over, I can see where my cups, my tea, my teaspoons, all of that kind of stuff is so that I can easily use it and access it. I'm no longer relying necessarily on the systems that are failing me or the systems that are having issues because my environment is doing that work for me. We encourage people to think about access. Level access showers and wet rooms are becoming increasingly accessible and increasingly beautiful and that's a wonderful thing. But again, issues around contrast come in. Huge numbers of uh, older men will end up in care, in part due to issues with consonants. And that, for some of them, could be dealt with, helpfully by adding a contrasting toilet seat, making it very clear that this is where the bathroom is, and not making you try to find a white, a white toilet against a white floor with a white toilet seat at two in the morning. You can see where some of the issues come in. The important part of it, all of it, is to encourage people and support people to think about these adaptations their way. If you're thinking about it ahead of time, you have a lot more freedom to think about, well, if I'm redoing my bathroom anyway, why couldn't it be a wet room? If I'm redoing my kitchen anyway, why couldn't it be that? If I'm going to replace my suite anyway, what is it that makes a suite particularly supportive for someone who's getting a bit older? How tall does it have to be? What does the back have to look like? If I'm buying new dining room chairs, what does that look like? As opposed to it being an adaptation that comes in and I don't have as much control. Supporting people to make these choices is a big part of moving forwards to an age inclusive future. So we need to move forward from this stigmatized understanding of what older people, what inclusive design is and who would benefit from it to, yeah, I might as well have it. It's pretty handy, actually. Moving from designing homes that we wouldn't want to live in to, oh, I'm sorry, I can, I can, I could have a rainbow colored uh, wet room. That's an option for me. Live your best life, friend. It's not for me, but you know, go, go out. And moving from a lack of awareness to understanding that there are options, understanding that not all of those options need to be put in place at the same time, and understanding that you can get support you can talk to people and that people will understand what it is that you're asking for. So really raising, raising that awareness in all quarters, fixing the world, essentially. Now, what can we do? While the project itself has ended, the Deshka website is still up and running and it will be until 2029. So on the Deshka website, which is www.deshka.co.uk, you can find not only the resources we created, including an easy booklet talking about hints and tips, uh, for adaptive home design, but our walkthrough uh, visual 
design and a bunch of other things, hopefully, which will be useful to you. If there's anything else that would be handy, do please let us know. There's always the possibility for us making something later down the line. And in the meantime, thank you very, very much for listening. Thank you, Kate. That was um, that was kind of really. I think it's a really interesting study to get that that kind of perspective. I mean, I think there's kind of lots of things in there that might kind of go against what, what's kind of perceived as the um, kind of typical understanding. I mean, kind of the the, the very few people who actually want a bath is was was quite surprising when you kind of think of Britain as a ba- a nation of bathers. How, how few people actually wanted to retain a bath, I, I think, would probably surprise most people. Baths came very low, which was interesting because we'd heard from several quarters that people do not necessarily think about taking a bath, but if you try to take the bath away, that's a huge issue. <laughs> taking the bath away is a no-go. Um, yeah. So, so, so people kind of like it there, just just in case, kind of for an annual soak or something. But uh, I think a lot of it was very much, you know, just in case. Um, but what if I do need it? What if I do trip? What if I do fall? Um, but also about what removing the bath sometimes means, especially if you're being told that you have to do it, as opposed to, well, if I'm going to get the bathroom redone, maybe I'll get a double wide shower. Maybe I'll get like a really fancy thing, and I'm trading it off for something that I want as opposed to being told that this is now something that I cannot have, which means I need to kind of deal with what that means for me. Yes, yeah. So I suppose the kind of thing that strikes me is that I I kind of hear quite a lot of people say that through kind of DFG, I know there's kind of a different system in in Scotland, but there's quite a lot of places, and and it it varies, these things always vary, but there are quite a lot of places that would do an adaptation as kind of cheaply as possible and the aesthetics make absolutely no um, kind of don't score anywhere in, in, in terms of the thought of what's provided. Um, do, do you think do you think there's kind of a case to be made that by doing that people are put off adaptations and kind of the preventative aspect of that is lost and, and kind of people are falling and there's um, kind of hip replacements and whatever that, that could have been prevented by have, having a more kind of attractive or acceptable type of adaptation 100 percent. i think one of the best and it, one of the best examples for this is this movement around uh, wet rooms and wet room bathrooms if you go back sort of what 10 15 years we're looking at that you know that glittery blue floor that very institutional feeling and then as they kind of gained recognition and they became more trendy not only did the price come down because the materials were more commonly used and people knew how to install them but people started even within our data set saying oh you know i i wasn't going to get a wet room and then you know brenda around the corner got one and actually it was really nice and i thought well i might as well have that if i was going to have that she's got a lovely little walk-in shower and i thought that would go everywhere but making these things so that they are very in fit in keeping with the idea and the vision of the home that someone's been cultivating sometimes remembering some of these people have been housewives their whole life this has been their whole job to keep their house beautiful and welcoming and being able to bring people into it as a social space of course they then want to continue that going forward and asking people to accept what they think is going to be ugly or intrusive is a massive issue it's the same thing that we get into around storage very often, because in some places storage is a luxury and it can be. But if you are, for example, living with any issues of continence, um, suddenly storage is a necessity. I can't have people around to my house if all of my continence stuff is sat on the side in the bathroom and my private business becomes public the minute they, they go to relieve themselves. It's exactly that kind of thing. Yeah. Did, did you have any of the kind of participants had moved into a home that had already been adapted in, in some way? Because um, I, I think we can see that a lot, that when adaptations are done cheaply and there's a change of resident or tenant, that there's quite a high likelihood that it all gets ripped out and it kind of, kind of turns kind of that cheap thing that, that's been kind of the perception that it was going to be cheap is, is twice as expensive because it's it's ripped out two years three years later and replaced with a bath sometimes and then that's ripped out and the show is put back in so kind of doing it once and doing it well I, I, I think there's a definite case to be made for that we 100% had people coming in and talking about oh you know particularly you know the white handle's got a huge amount of hate a huge amount of hate in the study um that I think partly because they were so intrusive but also it's a real signal of vulnerability towards the neighborhood and people felt very uncomfortable with that 
Um, so 100% where things were immediately obvious. And a lot of the things that we kind of trumpet and, and point out is that if they're integrated into the style that people have anyway, is you don't necessarily know why someone's gone for, for example, like a clear fronted cupboard, just that they have and it looks really pretty. You don't know why someone's chosen this or that. It's not trumpeting itself in, in that way. So people don't necessarily remove it. Um, but 100% that kind of, oh, I wouldn't go in or I wouldn't have this, even where a lot of the kind of professionals we spoke to were like, oh, no, we'd never, you know, people have to go in and we try and match adapted houses to people who need those adaptations as far as possible. There's always that, there's always that tricky part. And it's in particularly important if we're marrying up this idea of sustainability with aging sustainably, right? So increasingly we're aware that there's a carbon cost that comes with not just the manufacturing of the materials themselves, which if we're ripping out and putting in and ripping out and putting in, like obviously that's landfill, that's a huge issue. But there's a massive amount of carbon involved in putting feet on the ground to even install a thing. Um, the more kind of construction materials you need if you haven't thought about this kind of stuff ahead of time, all increasingly puts a load not on just on the people whose house it is who now need that adaptation or the people installing it, but on the planet itself. It's a really important narrative to kind of link in with as we move forward. Yeah. So as you mentioned, the project's now complete. Uh, is, is it kind of giving you ideas to do something else? Is, is kind of an, an, will it move on to a, to a next stage or what, what, what comes next? We're really, really lucky. At the moment, we are um, in the process of working out what's called a demonstrator. Um, so that is hopefully going to be something we can load onto literally the back of a lorry and tour around different places, initially in Scotland, um, which is particularly important because we've got some really rural communities and assuming that everyone can trip down to Stirling in central Scotland to have a quick look around the dementia suites is not really feasible. Whereas if we put something on the back of a lorry and we take it up, suddenly more people might put eyes on it, start to understand that ageing design does not necessarily have to be ugly design and think about that for their own lives. We're also taking it forward in a, a project that's focusing on intergenerational relationships because these kinds of houses and how we build houses for our communities in the future is going to be a massive part of how we age together as one community. Okay. Has there been any kind of governmental interest in, in Scotland in, in, in kind of the research or the kind of the ongoing um, um, kind of the things you just mentioned about the, the kind of lorry and, and other aspects of that? We've had we've had some really good engagement so far. We had um, a lovely visit from the Housing and Planning Subcommittee and we've had the opportunity to feed into some of the open calls around housing for very needs in Scotland. And there was a Westminster call out around about the same time last year. Um, but it's one of those things where building those connections and those relationships as we go forward is always going to be part of the process. Yeah. Um, so if you know anyone from the government is listening, we'd love to come and <laughs> we'd love to come and talk to you for sure. But every little every little uh, piece of awareness we can tick up is going to improve improve things overall. That's our hope. Great. Well, th thank you for joining us today, Kate. Again, it was uh, it's really really thank interesting you so to you for a second time. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm sure there'll be lots of interest in the truck um, as as you get it developed. Thank you so much. Thank you.